We're going to be installing a geothermal system in this house. This system is going to be a water to water system, which means the ground source is going to be water as well as the loop inside the house is going to be water. So instead of having forced air, we're going to have radiant loops in the floor. That's one of the best systems that you can go with and it's the most efficient. So there's a pond over there and basically we're going to run some loops from right down there going into the pond and underneath there was like a, an old walkout basement type thing so we're going to take this deck off we're going to run it into there so the plan was to put in the loop first but that was like two months ago and the materials got delayed so we're a little bit late on installing the loops in the ground and so now we have to wait until it's more feasible to do it because there's just there's frost in the ground right now so I don't think we're going to get to that loop until just at the beginning of the spring, which is not too far from now. But so we're kind of doing a little bit different of a plan than we were originally going to do. So now we're just going to start installing the stuff inside the house. So let me take you through what we're going to be doing. So this is going to be a little bit different of a video because I'm not the boss on this one. So I'm going to be a helper tagging along and I'm going to be learning just like you guys are. So I'll take you through it just how I am. So we're installing these, these are aluminum heat plates, transfer plates, put these up into the bays like this, two of them in each bay, and that transfers the heat much more efficiently into the floor. So in the addition here, we have a lot of stuff down here. So this is the old basement, we put some spray foam on the walls. And here is the crawl space entrance to the new crawl space that we just installed in some of the last videos. So they set these back from the end so they can make a nice loop around. Since this is just bridging right here, they can actually bore right next to the edge. But normally, if you have a framing member that's supporting some weight, you have to stay two inches away from both edges. And you also have to have a maximum of one sixth of the depth of the member. So it would be easier if this beam was set down, but then you'd be dealing with it walking in here. So they have to just kind of come down and then back up to go to the next bay, which there's none in there yet, but it's gonna continue through to the other ones over there. So you kind of have to make sure that you know where all your plumbing is going so that they don't put these plates right where you're gonna have the plumbing. So I got the plumbing all roughed in as far as where they go. There's different heat transfer plates that you can use to do this radiant heat. This is some of the best kind that you can use right here. It's nice thick aluminum. Some of them are just like real thin sheet metal.
bring a trench down around this way. And we're gonna do a pond loop. We're gonna come around with a five foot trench going through here. And it's too steep to bring the excavator down here and work comfortably. So we're gonna bring it around over here where it flattens out. That way there's a nice little pad for the excavator to sit. So it's about 250 feet over to here. And so what we're gonna do is install a pond loop for this geothermal, it's a water to water system. We're gonna try to be as deep as possible. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take the excavator and see how deep it is right now compared to the level of this pond because this level does change quite a bit throughout the year. I'd say this is about an average level right now. Sometimes it's a little bit higher. Uh, last year we had a kind of a drought, so it got lower, but this is the overflow. So you can see it needs to come up about four or five feet before it even hits this overflow. So that's the max that it can get. Um, and the minimum is about another three feet lower than that. So we want a minimum of about eight feet but deeper the better.
So the plan that we came up with now is going to be, we're going to come in at an angle like this. And then, so I'm going to dig about like that, about out like me 15 feet. I'm going to dig it about 12 feet deep. That way we can just come in it like that instead of going like that and then trying to go all the way out across. Because it's going to be about 20 feet in length. We're fusing the smaller pipes together for the loops that are going in the pond. And those are the bigger pipes there, two inch. So I'm about a third of the way dug. That gives it a nice straight cut. Yeah. Yeah, it gives it, you know what I mean? It lines up. Yeah. And it gives it a nice clean oh, so surface. It cuts, it cuts both sides at once. Yes, yeah, both sides at once. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, the bigger ones have an electric facer. Yeah. But this little one is like. This is like the old wine. The windows down here, right? Yeah. Gotta work a little bit. Which I'd rather have. Is that the temperature right there? Yeah, that's the temperature. Well, I'm looking at the bead. Yeah. What does that have to get up to? Or is that is that what it gets up to right there? About 500? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, between 450 and 500 is good. The bead is what you want to watch for. You want to watch the bead roll over, kind of. Yeah. Then you see how it fold out, yeah. rounded back, rolled back. Yeah. yeah. This here you want somewhere around 16 to an eighth an inch bead. And as the pipes get bigger, you want a little bit more. Yeah. You know what I mean? A lot. Yeah, I got to count on that. How many have we got on here so far? Six? Is this number six? That's just like a tensioner, keeps tension against it. Yeah. 
you don't want a lot of pressure against that fuse because if you put too much pressure against it, when you go to fuse it, the a lot of cold fuse. So that's what that tensioner is for, it gives it just the right enough pressure. Huh. Now watch when I take this out, watch the roll back. Ready? See it? Yep. That's what you want to look for. That's the, that's the ticket. Yep. That's like a perfect eighth inch. Yep. Okay guys, well, this is really disappointing, but we are gonna be changing plans here. I know my motto is can't isn't a word, but I can't dig deep enough right there to get this system in here. We need at least eight feet deep for about 10 feet wide and 30 feet long. 
that's that's all minimal it would definitely be nice to have it bigger than that wider deeper longer um but it's not going to happen this is all bedrock so i was going to drain some water out so i could see what i was doing because the rock is able to be moved but i can't see where it ends so that's the biggest problem with it if i could see what i was doing down here then i could probably get some of these rocks out maybe I'm not even sure but in order to do that we'd have to drain this whole thing and there's a big hill on that side and at the bottom of it there's like this little valley that runs into a pond and then it runs into a lake across the road so in order to drain this we would have to drain it into those bodies of water and i don't want to get involved in neighbors complaining about silt because you can put up a silt fence but it's still going to get in there so what we're going to do now is switch from the pond loop which is very unfortunate because we made up this this whole assembly right here this is for the pond we call this a raft so let me explain how this works these pvc pipes here are all glued together and there's nothing but air inside of them so they actually allow this whole assembly to float and to control where you want it because you don't want it right on the bottom of the pond because it'll collect silt and mud and stuff and you don't want any of that to be caught up in these coils because you can see they're spaced apart from each other so that the water can actually flow through it so you don't want anything to clog that up so so then we take blocks and anchor this whole assembly with the blocks and the amount of rope that comes off the blocks into this raft dictates how high it can sit off the bottom so the pvc makes it float and actually just even the pipe makes it float too even when it's filled with water and then you just control like we were going to give it a foot off of the bottom well actually originally we were going to do two feet off the bottom but there's just no way to get that deep so we have to abandon this whole thing and unfortunately this is not the right pipe to use for what we're going to do continuing on and so what we're going to do continuing on is we're just going to do trenches we already got 200 feet of trench up to right here so what i'm going to do is continue this on down that way and come around this way and then make one more bend back that way and the nice thing about trenches is if i hit bedrock somewhere and i can't get deep enough or just big boulders that i don't want to move by digging up the whole field then what I can do is just use some of this fill to put on top of it. So say I dig three feet down, then I can put three feet of fill on top. You want minimum of six feet of cover on top of these pipes. So I have plenty of fill here. You can see beyond the excavator here, this is hundreds of yards of stuff that I took out. So I can use some of this wherever I can't dig deep enough. So we're going to utilize this whole field in front of the pond here and just install a system there. There was a few different options that we could have done. We could have just taken it down the road that way, right alongside the road. But the problem is we get to a telephone pole and a big tree right next to each other over there. And then we have to go into down further a lot. The, the elevation drops a lot right beside it. So that really wasn't the best option. We could also cross the road, but that's also not the best option. So I think this is going to be the easiest and cheapest way to go. It's going to cost a little bit more money to do this, but we really have no option at this point. Usually the reason that you do a pond loop is to save money because this right here is all that you need. And actually he specced it out so that we only need these three loops right here. So the fourth one is just kind of a bonus, like extra, just to make sure. So that is all you need to power the geothermal system but not if you can't get it deep enough. So I, I was trying to save the customer some money by doing these pond loops, but it turns out it's just not gonna happen. So we'll just roll with the punches and keep going. So you can see we have it all backfilled by hand up into about there. And then 
from there on we have to still put a foot of cover by hand on it you got to keep the pipes separated as much as you can in the trench which we still need to do over there right here we hit an old septic tank um, the customer says that they had a new one installed so that one should be abandoned Once we fill this up a little bit more, I'm going to cut this foam down, lay a piece of foam on top of that flat, and then I'm going to put a layer of concrete on that just to level it out, and then I'm going to put some blocks going all the way up to the ceiling. Two inch poly ISO is about R13, so that's a nice barrier between them. Because this is the beginning of the loop and that's the end of the loop, so there's going to be a lot of temperature difference between them. Okay, so before I continue that trench over there, I need to go right through here. So the first thing I wanna do is take any of this fill that I don't need and put it back in. So I think to help the customer a little bit, what I'm gonna do is make a little area right here where they can kind of get into the water easier, kind of like a beach, because all these other areas around this pond are really steep going into the water. Like they have an old dock over there, but everything is like a five or six foot drop and it just drops right off. There's no like flat area going in that you could put some sand and have a little beach. So I figured this would be the best area to do that because I already dug most of it out and I can use some of that fill up.
got a nice bevel on it put it back just like that and this time I'll use 7018 AC rods Okay, that should be a lot better now. Not the cleanest looking welds, but they'll definitely hold up pretty good. It's got a lot of weld on it right there. So the way I'm gonna run this loop is bring it around this way, which I'm about there right now. I'm gonna bring it over here, make a wide turn around and back right beside the road and just keep going down the road until I got my full 600 feet. The digging is getting a little bit better over here. Not done with rocks, will never be around here, but at least it's a lot, a lot less of a ratio. See these boulders. Most of these are three, four feet. We're just backfilling everything by hand. Kind of knock the stuff down into the trench. In and around the pipes. Underneath of them, over top of them, on the side of them. Try to get 10 to 12 inches of cover on top and then backfill with the machine. Carefully still.
starting to get this graded out here. I'm working with nothing but rocks, so it's not that easy. But you can see we're getting somewheres with it. Working our way down this way. Trying to get rid of some of these rocks. Like you can see that pile of rocks over there. I can't really do anything with those, so we're just gonna transport them over to a place where they're just gonna be kind of dumped. I took down this little tree here that was completely dead and all the brush around it, so we'll take that and get rid of it. So we had ourselves a mess and we still have a mess, but we're getting somewheres eventually. Working with what we got. Trench is full of water. And that's all the pipe we have for right now. So I'm gonna keep looping around, make a big loop around this way, come back down the driveway about 300 feet that way. And then we'll be done. drop in the trench.
trying to get the pipe as far as we can apart from each other.
All right, guys. So this geothermal system is all done here. So I'm gonna give you a rundown the best I can because I'm not an expert on this. I'm not even close. Those are the ground loops that come from outside. Those come up and around and go into the flow center. There's a circulation pump here. And basically all that does is that circulates it into the geothermal system, which in turn also circulates it back out for the return. So when that water comes in from the ground loop into the system, here is the main geothermal system. This is water to water. And basically it comes in and out. And then this is the other side of the loop that goes into the house. That's the heated side. So there's another circulator pump on the return. And basically to describe this very briefly and simply, it takes water from the outside and through refrigeration and compression, it uses refrigerant just like a refrigerator or an air conditioner or even a heat pump that uses the air, like an air source heat pump. Basically what it does is it extracts the heat out of the ground loop through refrigeration. And so this is the manifold here. There's three different zones. And when a thermostat calls for heat, it's going to turn one of these zones on. And basically it's going to take water from this tank. This is a storage tank. And the set point here is at 110. Right now it's at 105. And as soon as the loop calls for heat via the thermostat, it's going to open up these valves here. And it's going to let the water flow from here into the loops. So you can see we got the loops up here. And then when the temperature in this tank gets low enough, this is going to send a signal to this unit to turn on. And then it's going to circulate through these pipes right here. It's going to circulate into this tank. So this is the valve control center right here. And all your thermostats tie right into here. And this is kind of like the brains of everything. And then this will call one of these zones to open up. And so out of this tank, we got an expansion tank here. And also, and this is something you don't normally see, but we also have a domestic water tank that runs off of this. So this actually has a loop inside of it, kind of like a heat exchanger inside of it. And basically it takes the water from this system and just keeps circulating it around until it gets to the temperature that it needs to be. So every time it goes around, it makes like a one or two degree increase until it gets to the point where the tank tells it that it's warm enough via an aquastat, which I believe is right in there. And an aquastat is basically something that takes the reading of the temperature from the water via the pipe and it has an on off switch and aquastats come in two different forms they can either be always on or always off and then that way when it reaches a certain temperature it either opens or closes and guys just bear with me anybody that does this for a living is probably laughing right now because i don't have the best way to explain this because i am definitely not well versed with with all this stuff i would probably never attempt to install a system like this without some help so there's another circulator pump right here so there's actually three circulator pumps. There's one right there, one right there, and one right there. This pump gets the water into the tank. That pump circulates the water into the manifold and around into the house. When a thermostat is calling for heat, it sends a signal to this TACO zone valve control center. And basically then it opens up the corresponding loop um, via these little things right here that's kind of like what controls and opens up each loop separately or together in some cases like there's two loops for the living room so it would turn on both of these at once and this is the return coming back in and so the pump actually pumps the return back in that way the pump doesn't get nearly as hot because it's on the return side so it's seeing the colder water instead of heating it up with the warmer water. So over the years, I've always been fascinated with geothermal systems. And it seems like whenever I talk to people 
about half the time they don't really believe the way that it works. They don't believe that you can take 50 degree water and make it into 120 degree water. But I'm here to tell you that it works. And there's lots of lots of systems out there being used. And it uses the same process, which is kind of complicated, but at the same time, it's the same exact process of a refrigerator or a air conditioner or a heat pump outside. When you're taking water from the ground and using it as the source, it's much more efficient and consistent than using, let's say, air. So an air heat pump, um, a lot of them are air to air, like you would see the mini splits. That's using the air temperature outside and using the same process to extract the heat. And by the way, this system is also reversible for air conditioning. It's got a reversing valve in it so that you can use it for air conditioning as well. Now with a water to water system, it's a little bit more complicated to run the air conditioning than it is for a water to air system, which most geothermal systems are water to air. So that means basically that this unit would just have the ground loops coming in and then out from that would just be a bunch of duct work. And then you just install that just like any other HVAC system that you would have like central air. But those aren't nearly as efficient and they're also not nearly as comfortable as having the heat in the floor. The downside is they are a little bit more money. They are a little bit more complicated and you do have to do a lot more work to get air conditioning. So to have air conditioning in this unit, Basically what you'd have to do, there's several ways. You could either have a fan coil system down here and then duct it to the rest of the house. Or what you can do, and this is kind of cool the way this works, is you can actually use your existing lines here, but just add a couple zones in there for the, for the cooling. And then basically what you'd do is you'd go to each spot in the house with just one pipe there and one pipe back. And then you would insulate those pipes because they're going to be having condensation on them and stuff. So you have to always insulate the pipes that are cooling unless it's in conditioned space and exposed. And basically you would run that to separate fan coils. Like in my house where I live right now, I actually set my house up to use geothermal. And I actually set it up to use cooling for the geothermal too because I actually have one of these units right here. And it's a water to water unit and basically I set it up with fan coils to each location in the house so you can have different zones for the cooling and those fan coils have a condensation drip pan on the bottom with a drain because whenever you're cooling air it's going to create condensation so you need to make sure that you take all these measures so that you don't have water just in random places in your house rotting things away. So if we were to do cooling with this system, all we would have to do is put fan coils wherever we would need them, which you can either use like one or two big fan coils or you can get like mini fan coils and use one in each room. And they have all different kinds of options for that. In my house, I actually used a mini duct fan coil for upstairs and it's got four four inch ports coming out of it for the air. And right now I'm just using it for heating and I decided not to put the geothermal system in because I live in the village and I have natural gas which is much easier and it's pretty cheap to run for my heat. And most of the time I run just my wood stove anyway so I don't even really need heat. So that's kind of supplemental heat. I was planning on installing a geothermal system and so I set my house up for that. But my new house that I'm building, which you guys are watching and following along, that's going to have a geothermal system. And I already have the system for it. I just need to install everything. And I'm going to put the pond loop in. So there's pros and cons for each different kind of system. Ideally, this system is the most efficient. It's just a little bit harder to get the cooling with it. As long as you get a reversing valve installed in the actual unit, then you can always add on in the future for the cooling. Out of respect for the customers and the installer here, I'm not going to go through the details about pricing, but just know that I will be installing a geothermal system on my house and I will go through all the pricing on that. And just know that you also get some incentives to install these from your local utility company as well as you get some tax credits 
to offset the price. So that being said, the price of this install was brought down to the level where it's somewhat comparable to a regular central air system. One of the great things about this system versus a central air system is the fact that you have the radiant heat in the floor. I'm a really big fan of that. Basically, you can set the temperature to a lot lower of a temperature and still feel more comfortable than you would with a house that has forced air. Because the heat is radiating out of the floor instead of pulling the heat out of your body from the floor, which it normally does, it's actually adding heat into the floor. So if you're comfortable at 72 degrees, you could probably turn this down to 67 degrees and probably feel even more comfortable. Now that doesn't mean that the water going through here is 67 degrees. That just means that the thermostat is reading 67 degrees. This water running through here, I think he has it set at 110. So that's the water that's going through these loops. Now, you might need to turn that up if you have a thicker floor or if you have a lot of wood on the floor or if you have concrete, you need to turn that up a little bit. But for stuff like in the kitchen here where it's all tile, the tile floor is actually a very good candidate for radiant heat. So I know you guys haven't seen the video about upstairs there yet, but we did install tile floor. That video will be coming out pretty shortly here. Another option that you could do for domestic water is a de-superheater and that goes inside of the unit itself. I'm not sure how to compare that to this system. I don't know which one's better and which one's more efficient. I'm assuming that this is a better way to go. I did do a brief geothermal video a few years ago with Eric. He's the same guy that installed this system here. So if you guys want to search back on that, you can find his channel too. I'll leave a link in the description for his channel. He's been trying to get some videos going. He has a lot of footage from all his jobs. He just has a hard time finding time to edit it. So I will leave the link in the description for his channel in case you guys want to check it out. He's also going to be helping me install the system in my house. And we do have a couple other projects coming up with some solar installs. Basically, he does solar, geothermal, and wind turbines. That's, that's pretty much all he does every day. So he really kind of specializes in this stuff, and that's why he's able to, to put it together. Because this is very complicated. This is not something that this is like DIY kind of thing. I'm going to try to learn how to do it in my house through his help so that maybe in the future I can do another one on my house. I would never install this for a customer, though. It's just way too complicated. You guys know how much stuff I get into. I don't need another thing on my plate that I need to worry about. I'll leave that to him. And normally I wouldn't say that about anything, but with geothermal, it's just not something that you really, you really got to be an expert to do this kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, you can't even buy this unit unless you're certified. This is a water furnace five series. This is a very good unit. It's probably top of the line. So they are all done with this system and they're not here right now. Otherwise, I would have them help me go through this and explain it better. But when I go to install it in my house, we're definitely going to break it down even further than what we have right now. I'll really get into some fine details because I want to learn it myself. For somebody that installs hydronic geothermal systems, this is probably a pretty simple setup and layout here. But... For somebody that just installs geothermal systems that are water to air, this is probably pretty complicated. So you can see we got the loops all over the whole house. And even inside of the crawl space. Eric has done many installs in houses where it made the house net zero. If you start out with a nice sealed house like an ICF house, you add geothermal and solar and some battery backup and you are completely off-grid or at least able to be off-grid and you're actually producing energy and getting paid for it and you never have a utility bill. 
this house isn't going to be like that because it's an old house and it doesn't have solar but maybe in the future he he was asking about solar in my opinion a geothermal system is a really good option for any house even existing houses or new houses old houses new houses leaky houses tight houses any kind of house can benefit from a water to water geothermal system i don't think i'll ever be interested in a water to air system just because i don't like duct work i don't like the noise that it makes um, i don't like the fact that it spreads pollens around the house and all that kind of stuff I, and dust i like a silent system which that's what this is when this geothermal unit turns on, you can barely even hear it turn on unless you're right next to it. If you were to compare this to an air-to-air -air system like a mini split would be, like a heat pump that sits outside, that air-to-air -air system is basically using the temperature that it is outside. So, for instance, when it gets cold out, the colder it gets, the longer that system needs to run and the more power it uses to get it up to temperature. And then, of course, once you get down to a certain temperature, they don't work anymore. A lot of them do claim to work even in the negative Fahrenheit degree range. But they are a lot less efficient at that point. So you're running the, the unit more, using more power. And when it gets down to the point where it's really cold, then it just sits there running the whole time. And then it's not that efficient. The nice thing about this system is that it's always using a pretty constant temperature. So around here it's about 50 degrees in the ground, give or take a few degrees. That temperature stays that temperature all year. Hot or cold outside, it doesn't matter. It's six feet down and that temperature never really changes much. So when this is heating, the return coming back into the ground is usually actually almost frozen water. So when you're using this system to heat, from the ground it's coming in with 50 degree water and then out is coming a lot colder water even almost to the point where it's freezing and you can actually freeze up the ground if you size the loop wrong and so i believe there is glycol in the ground loop for that reason because a lot of times your return is going to have freezing temperatures going into the ground so that's why you need to have the antifreeze or glycol a lot of people think that you're just starting with the 50 degree water and then you're heating it up from there and that's becoming your heat. But that's not the case. You're actually extracting the heat from that 50 degree water, not using it in conjunction with another heat source. That's not what you're doing. You're actually extracting it from it. So when it returns back into the ground, it's much colder. Eric actually has an app on his phone that will alert him if there's a problem with this system. And he can also see a lot of the real-time data about it. So if something happens in the middle of the winter and this thing shuts off or the ground loop starts leaking or just any variable thing, just anything that could happen that goes wrong, he has access to that data just by picking up his phone and he can check what's going on and he can kind of diagnose it without even coming to the site. That's really nice because that eliminates coming out and trying to diagnose it in the middle of the night or the middle of the winter or, or whatever. So say if this system has a fault all of a sudden, well, he's gonna get an alert on his phone instantly before the customer even knows that the system shut down, he's gonna get an alert on his phone and he can most likely diagnose it, figure out what the problem is, and possibly even turn it back on right from his phone. So I hope this video was helpful for people that were thinking about getting a geothermal system or just curious about how it works. So we're all done with this system. I'm wrapping up the video about this addition, which I know you guys have been waiting a long time for, so that'll be out shortly. But in the meantime, I'll catch you guys on the next geothermal video, which will be in my house.